to be here, and it's a blessing to be a part of uh, this great assembly and to be amongst the people of God. Uh, we've been blessed thus far to be able to worship the Lord in spirit as well as in truth, to be able to sing hymn songs and spiritual songs even on this morning, and then we've been able to approach the throne of grace boldly as the Bible instructs us to do, and then we had an opportunity to break bread with one another um, at the Lord's table. And um, now we get an opportunity to hear another portion of God's word. Amen. And um, what we're going to be dealing with on this morning is in the vein of a series we started. We started over in Isaiah chapter number nine, um, but we wrapped up and concluded um, Isaiah the ninth chapter verse six and seven. Now we're going to be going over to Isaiah the 53rd chapter, the 53rd chapter, and if you would, if you would, if you're able, if you'll stand with me as we go over to Isaiah the 53rd chapter, beginning at verse number one, and we will read verse number one, two, and verse number three. Isaiah the 53rd chapter, verse number one, two, and verse number three. The Bible says, in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter, beginning at verse number one. Who has believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And, we, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. And this is where I'll be taking my title from, verse number three. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. Uh, you may be seated. I'm going to be talking to a few talking to you for a few moments from the title or the topic the despised servant the despised servant and uh, we're just going to deal with verse number one through three and we'll deal with uh, some of the other verses and our uh, messages to come When we look at the book of Isaiah, Isaiah had a lot to say about the coming Messiah. Although Isaiah was written over 700 years prior to Jesus' birth, he had a lot to say about the Messiah. A lot of what Isaiah has said has been called the great passion of others have labeled it as the Mount Everest of prophetic literature in chapter 53 this is considered the summit of everything that Isaiah has to say about Christ Jesus verse 1 we have a prophecy where Isaiah says this is a prophecy of unbelief the test asks, it says, who has believed our report? And into whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Here's the translation. Who has believed? Who has trusted? Who has relied upon or clung to our message or that which was revealed to us? Or the translation can be, when, when the servant comes, who will believe this message of the uh, uh, exaltation of the servant from such a deep state of 
degradation. Who will have recognized in this the victorious and powerful arm of Jehovah? So this question is being asked. And we know from studying the Bible, some believe that these questions were raised by Isaiah. Others think they were questions raised by God through the pen of Isaiah. Um, Many scholars believe that Isaiah presents a prophetic look at the Jews who are discussing the death of the Lord. Let me back up and just give you what I just said in layman's terms, if you will. Um, some believe that Isaiah as a man was saying, who is going to believe this report? And then others believe that God is saying that prophetically when Jesus comes in the earth realm, there are going to be some that do not believe, right? Now, we know from Luke, the 24th chapter, even though Jesus had done many wonders among folks, the Bible talks about even after his resurrection, there were two disciples that were on the road to Emmaus, and they were talking about the death of our Lord. And Jesus joined them and entered into the conversation. And the Bible says they did not know it was him until after. After listening to the men for a while, Christ expounded upon the scriptures. And the Bible says, finally, their eyes were open and they knew Christ had been in their midst. And the Bible says, even after God opened up their eyes, the Bible says Jesus vanished from without their midst. And the Bible says, then they began to marvel at the fact that they did not realize that Christ had been in their presence. So I'm saying all that to say that sometimes when God is doing something, even in our midst, even as something as significant as Jesus, if we don't uh, have God or God, uh, we don't allow God to open up our eyes fully, we can miss the move of God. The Bible says, then they began to marvel that Jesus had been in their midst. It is believed by students of the Bible that verse one of our text is used to express amazement at the sinful failure of the Jews to recognize the Messiah in their midst. This verse then marvels at the spiritual blindness of Israel. This verse points to the shocking fact that the Hebrew people did not see the strong arm or power of Jehovah God in the events that were centered around the cross. Both Jesus and Paul applies this statement of Isaiah, of Isaiah to humanity's failure to receive and obey the gospel. John, the 12th chapter, verse number 37 says that though Christ performed many miracles, the people did not believe on him. So once again, Isaiah said, who has believed our report? And unto whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Now, this is important. I, I know I'm spending some time on this because this is an important um, point. Um, be turning with me over to the New Testament. Let's turn over to the New Testament, and we're going to look at Romans chapter number 10. Romans chapter number 10, and we're going to see um, where this same statement shows up in the New Testament. Romans chapter number 10. And we'll begin reading at verse number 13. And we will conclude our reading at verse number 17. But look what the Bible says. The Bible says in Romans chapter number 10, beginning at verse number 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then verse number 14 says, how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad, 
glad tidings of good things. And then verse number 16 says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. And then listen who he quotes. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So when we look at the book of Romans, the Bible says Paul is speaking of the need of the gospel being preached. And then in verse 16, he says, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our report? In large, the Jews did reject the gospel. They could not believe that Jehovah's arm was revealed in an in, 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 uh, uh, itinerant Galilean. They, they couldn't believe that the Messiah would come as the son of a carpenter, John, the first chapter, verse number 11. The Bible says that Christ came to his own and his own received him not. John, the fifth chapter, verse number 40 says, Christ said to the Jews, Ye will not come unto me that ye may have life. And, and even today, as we're looking for a Bible application for our day, things aren't much different. People think that they are acceptable to God, and they believe that they can be acceptable to God while still being an atheist. People think that they can be acceptable to God by putting their culture over God's word. Amen. People think that they can be acceptable to God by embracing the religions of the world. People even think they can be acceptable to God by partially believing in what God has said. Some people think that they can be acceptable to God because they believe intellectually but will not act on his commands. Some believe that they can put the material world over the spiritual world and still be acceptable to God. Amen. 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 Lights Amen. out. Amen. Amen. All right. I really got to break it on this morning. Amen. 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 Okay, there we go. <laughs> I don't know what that's about, but we're going to keep going. Uh, uh, there are some who still believe that they can put programs over the person of Christ. And some still believe that they don't have to obey the gospel of Christ, but they are still all right with God. In verse 2, I think we see the cause of their unbelief. The text states, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He has no form nor comeliness. And when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Another rendition of this text reads as follows. It was the plan of God that his servant take the form of man and grow up like a fragile green plant sprouting from dry and sterile ground. In our eyes, there was nothing in him to make him attractive as king or messiah. We saw nothing in him to make us want to follow him as our leader. In this verse, verse number two, Christ is likened here as to a tender plant. The tender plant is equivalent to a twig or a sapling. It is derived of nourishment from the trunk. So this means that the tender plant was cut off by men to preserve the tree. Y'all see this? Uh, he was cut off from the trunk of the tree and now he's drying up. This is how man would, would, would view the Messiah. 
See, the point here is that Christ grew up in Nazareth. Christ grew up in an unfavorable environment. He was then considered a nobody. That's why they asked in John, the first chapter, verse number 46, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? In our text, Christ is likened to an insignificant vegetation that is fit only for destruction. And this brings us to our second point in our text. A root growing in a dry soil has no chance or promise that it will grow and survive. From man's point of view, one who was born in a lowly stable of humble surroundings, one who grew up in an obscure village had no chance of being the promised Messiah. Y'all got to stay with me because Isaiah is prophesying this hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus is even conceived in the birth canal of a virgin. Mankind rejected Christ in the gospel because of, the, because of some things that he did not possess. Isaiah said he had no form. He had no kingly or royal pomp. He had no comeliness or dignity. He had no beauty as Isaiah describes it. He did not have, uh, and y'all know the Bible talks about some personalities that came before Jesus as possessing beauty. Y'all remember Joseph? The Bible describes him as a handsome man. Y'all remember? That's why Potiphar's wife wanted to get her hands on Because the Bible describes him as a handsome man. Not only did the Bible describe Joseph as a handsome man, remember the Bible described the three Hebrew boys as good-looking young men. Y'all remember that? And Daniel? But also the Bible describes Daniel as a good looking young man. The Bible describes David as a good young, uh, a good looking young man. Remember Absalom who hair flowed so long and he was, uh, you know, he was the man around there. And he cut his hair and all the girls go crazy when he care, cut his hair every year. Uh, that's in your Bible in 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel. Uh, uh, but the Bible describes Absalom as a good looking young man. And then Moses. Remember Moses? Mm -hmm. The Bible says one of the reasons that the Hebrew women kept him because when they looked on him, they seen something within him, right? Mm -hmm. On the surface. And then let's go over to the women. Y'all remember Esther of the Old Testament? Amen. The Bible describes her as a good looking woman. Amen. She was so good looking that she entered into a beauty contest in one. Y'all yes. remember that? But the Bible is saying with us knowing all that, when it came to Jesus, when we looked on him, <laughs> there was nothing in him on the surface that would cause us to be attracted to him. He had no form. He had no beauty. There was nothing of the show or glitter which will attract the earthborn soul to Christ. Everything that attracted us to Jesus was from within. He was destitute of brightness and glory without. Israel would have welcomed a puffed up and armor dressed warrior riding forth to deliver them from the oppression of Rome. But he came as the meek and lowly one. So they did not desire him. They wanted someone like King Saul. Who stood head and shoulders above the people. 
a king after man's eyes and not after God's heart. Amen. Now, in verse number three, we are forced to consider the scandalous treatment of God's servant. Verse number three says he is despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And the Bible says, we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Now, another version says, in fact, we despised and rejected him. He suffered the sorrow of rejection and the grief of unbelief, as well as our physical persecution. We went out of our way to shun him and ignore him. Verse 3 is a solemn and melancholy verse. It is stained with an awful sadness. Here the word he points to the incarnate Christ. He the servant of Jehovah. He, the Lord Jesus Christ. He, the Lord of Lords. And to he who is the monarch of the whole earth. The Bible says he was despised. That is to say, he was scorned. He was held in contempt. This means that he had no place in the opinion of or regard of men. Amen. He was treated as though he was less than a man. He was one, he was one from whom all men did shrink. Christ was not only despised, he was also rejected. This means that he was forsaken. It means that men were unimpressed or repelled by him. It means that mankind withdrew its favor and thus shunned him. The Bible tells us in John 1 11 that the Jews did forsake him. The Bible tells us in Matthew the 26th chapter verse 14 through 16 that Judas did betray him. The Bible tells us in John the 6th chapter verse 66 and Matthew the 26th chapter verse number 53 even his disciples forsook him. The Bible tells us that he is rejected of men. In our text, it calls him a man of sorrow. Now, first of all, I can't run past this point. Christ was a man. John said that the word became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1 14. But I want us to see what Timothy said about him being a man. Let's turn over to 1 Timothy 2 5. 1 Timothy 2 5. And I'm going to try my best to give you a chance to get over there before I begin reading. But 1 Timothy um, chapter number 2. And we're going to look at one verse. And that's going to be verse number 5. Look what the Bible says in regard to Jesus. The Bible says, for there is one God. Listen to this, y'all. One God and one mediator between God and men. And then the Bible says the man, Christ Jesus. The man Christ Jesus. So he was fully God, but he was fully man as he walked this earth. Amen. That's why the Hebrew writer told us this way. He said, we don't have a high priest that is not, not touched with our infirmities. Because though he was tempted in all areas, he is still without sin. And, and, and I think I'll get happy right through here. 
because we don't have a God that cannot identify with what we deal with on a day in and day out basis. Jesus knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was to be thirsty. He knew what it was to be homeless. He knew what it was to weep and lose a loved one. Jesus can identify with those who were divorced, those who were married. He can identify with the children. He can identify with the business folks. He can, he can identify with those without a job. He can identify with those who have been in prison. Jesus has been touched of all of our infirmities because he was the man, Christ Jesus. Amen. So Timothy says, the man, Christ Jesus. Paul called Christ a man. He wore the robe of human flesh for 33 years. Christ was not only a man, he was a man of sorrows. The word sorrows means he was weighed down with pain. Mm -hmm. Our Lord certainly knew what bodily pain was. He knew what mental anguish was all about. He knew what spiritual trauma was all about. And I already alluded to the fact that the Bible tells us three times that Jesus wept. I know oftentimes we quote John the 11th chapter, verse number 35, because that's the shortest uh, verse in the Bible. But the Bible says that he wept two other occasions. Luke, the 19th chapter, verse number 41. And then also we find where the Bible says that he wept in Hebrews, the 5th chapter, verse number 7. His soul was exceedingly sorrowful, even unto death, Mark the 14th chapter, verse number 34. The Bible says, as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was in great agony. His sweat became, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground, Luke the 22nd chapter, verse number 44. And I like to say no greater expression of sorrow could be found than that of Matthew, the 27th chapter, verse number 46. The Bible says, Jesus cried out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? See, Christ was the man of sorrows because he was despised and rejected by humanity. Another reason he was a, a, a man of sorrow was because he was acquainted with grief or with sickness. The grief or sickness that Christ was acquainted with was sin. God likens Israel's spiritual condition to a sickness. If you're still with me, turn over to Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 5 and 6. I, I just want us to see how God equates sin to sickness. Jesus was acquainted with sorrow because he was acquainted with our sins. If you're in Isaiah, the first chapter, verse 5 and 6, the Bible says... The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and petrifying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. The Bible describes Israel's condition, their sin sinful condition as a sickness. And then if we look at James, James the fifth chapter, verse number 16, he tells us that uh, a confession of sin in prayer brings about a healing. If we want to be healed from sin or our sickness that comes with sin, he says, confession and prayer brings forth healing. First Peter, the second chapter, verse number 24, tells us that 
It is by Christ's stripes that we are healed. The word healed is used in these texts in the spiritual sense. Surely our Lord was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief because the Bible says humanity hid its face from him. Mankind was and is sickened and ashamed of Christ. And the Bible says mankind esteemed him not. That is to say mankind deemed Christ insignificant. The hatred of the Jews against him was so intense and mysterious. One expert in Judaism wrote, he said, I have known personally some amiable and lovable people among the Jews. He said, but as soon as the name of Jesus is mentioned, a change came over their continents and they would fall into a fit of anger. I'm almost finished. Even in the Talmud, and this is a book of the Jews, T-A-L-M-U-D, the very names by which Jesus is called are blasphemous. They named Jesus who in the Hebrew should be Yahshua, they changed the spelling of his name to Yasha. They don't put the A on it. And what this indicates is his name and his memory should be blotted out. This also indicates that he was a transgressor. And then the Jews also called him Tolo, T-O-L-U-I, the hang one, which is equivalent to the accursed one. So they subscribe Jesus and his doings as witchcraft or Beelzebub. And as I close, the tragedy of tragedies is when mankind rejects Christ. Amen. The tragedy of tragedies is when mankind rejects the gospel. How shamefully we have treated the one who did for us on the cross <laughs> what we could not do for ourselves. Amen. On Calvary, all human sorrow was hid in his wounds. At the cross, Satan's armor was removed. At Calvary, the fires of the law are extinguished. At the cross, our condemnation is lifted and the death of sin is made certain. At Calvary, the door of heaven is opened and the fountain of salvation is unsealed. At the cross, the world is stripped of all its charms and the bitterness of life is sweetened. At Calvary, the shadows of death are dispelled and the darkness of eternity is brightened. This despised servant, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, can save you. He can seal you. He can sanctify you. And he can make you superior. He can consecrate you. He can cleanse you. He can change you. Amen. He can cure you. Mm -hmm. And he also can even crown you. Amen. He can turn a pauper into a prince, mm -hmm. a prodigal into a priest, a castaway into a Christian. His saving grace sings a song when we sorrow. Yes. His grace shouts hallelujah when we die. His grace sweeps us into a golden chariot beyond the stars to the gates of pearls. His grace takes advantage of what Christ did and of what Christ is and of what Christ can do even now 
by obeying the gospel. Amen. Amen. When we think about what Christ has done for us, we ought to claim our spiritual blessings that's found in Christ Jesus. Ephesians, Amen. the first chapter, verse number three, it, it tells us that all spiritual blessings are in Christ Jesus. Amen. The Bible tells us how we assess those blessings. First John, the first chapter, verse number nine says that we got to be willing to confess our faults. Yes. The Bible tells us that he will restore us. And then Acts, the 8th chapter, verse 21 through 24, tells us that we got to be willing to put Christ Jesus on, even in baptism. Amen. Even on this morning, as we reflect on the despised servant, we are not to delay. See, sin is so despicable that Christ had to die. Sin is disobedience. Sin is rebellion. Sin is treason. Sin is spiritual suicide. Amen. Sin is the work of Satan. Sin is ignorance. Sin is folly. Sin is madness. Sin is sickness. Sin is a poison. Sin is a plague. Sin is death. Amen. Sin built hell. Sin produced the worm that would not die and, and the fire that cannot be quenched. Sin is outer darkness that no ray of light has ever entered. Sin is a viper that has fastened its fangs upon our souls. Sin is hot as lava pouring out of a volcano upon Mankind's soul. Sin is like quicksand. Pulling our souls further and further and further away from Christ Amen. and down to a devil's hell. On this morning, as we reflect on the despised servant, Jesus bore it all, so we wouldn't have to bore it. I like, I, I like what the Corinthian writer said. The Bible says, though he was rich, he became poor that we may be rich. Amen. And I like what Jesus said. Jesus said, I came to give you life. And I came to give you life more abundantly. Amen. In that same chapter, he said the enemy came to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. But I came to give you life. Jesus. Oh, God. And I was thinking about this as I was studying this and meditating upon this. The, the reason I was able to celebrate a 40, 40th birthday is because of Jesus. Because if Satan would have had his way, I would have been gone a long time ago. Amen. And if Satan would have had his way, I'd be a slave to sin in this very moment. Amen. But because Jesus was despised, Thank you, Lord. one who never did anything but right and good, he was despised and sorrowful for our behalf. He was acquainted with sin on our behalf. Now we're able to live life fully, and live life with a clear conscience. Able to live life with some peace. On this first Sunday in 2019, you ought to come and get your peace back. If the devil has robbed you of your peace, as a child of God, the Bible tells us in Timothy that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a power in a sound mind. But the devil would try to rob us of our peace. Amen. Try to take us out of our purpose. Yes. And even on this morning, all we got to do is come to God and say, I want it back. Hmm. Amen. Because Jesus went through too much to redeem us. Oh God, I'm close. I got to close because it's getting good to me. Amen. It's getting good to me, Sister Carter. I should have stayed on the paper. But it's getting good to me. 
But Jesus said on one occasion, he said, my sheep can no man pluck out of my hand. The enemy will try to come in and rob God's sheepfold. But Jesus said, if I got my hand on you, I'm not going to let you go. The only thing, like the song we saw, we got to do our part. We got to hold to God's unchanging hand. Amen. Jesus already committed. I'm not going to let you go. Yes. But we have the choice whether we want to let his hand go. Yes. But I want to encourage you on this morning to make the grip stronger. Amen. Amen. I'm holding on, as we say, what we say by a rope, a knot. What's that saying? By a knot. But I'm going to make my grip stronger. No matter what come against me, I'm going to hold on to Jesus because he done too much on my behalf. So I won't have to go to a devil's hell. On this morning, we're going to stand and sing the song that's been selected for encouragement. And we want you to make your request known even on this morning. Just as I